All right, let's open up to the book of Nehemiah. The book of Nehemiah. <clears throat> and Brother Jay was right, Lord willing, we will preach a series this week. And the series title would be Your Place of Fellowship. Your Place of Fellowship. And we're going to go through the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter number one, we'll read the first four verses. We'll have prayer and jump right into it this morning, this evening. Nehemiah chapter number one, verse number one. <clears throat> Nehemiah one, one. It's in the Old Testament. <laughs> All right, I know you got it. All right, Nehemiah one, one, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. And it came to pass in the month Chislu, in the twentieth year, as I was in Shushan the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept, and mourned certain days, and fasted, and prayed before the God of heaven. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we pray you'd bless the time in your word. We just asked, I know we've already prayed over the camp, but we pray over the message here as well. Lord, that you might just minister with the Scriptures. We know your Word has what we need. And so, God, we pray that you'd open up. I pray you'd set me aside and that you might just bless in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Now, here we notice that Nehemiah has gotten word, even though he's not in Jerusalem, he's gotten word about the condition of Jerusalem. Now, for those of you that might be a little bit new to this or maybe not familiar the nation of Israel had went into captivity in Babylon. And about 70 to 80 years, possibly around 100 years previous to this, Zerubbabel had led a group into Jerusalem and restored some order in Jerusalem. And then later on, about 10 to 14 years prior to this, Ezra, you see the book right in front of Nehemiah, he had went back into the area of Jerusalem and had established the temple worship had laid the foundation and had gotten some things going about 14 years or so prior to this time. Nehemiah is in the kingdom of the Persians. And Nehemiah here is obviously a Jew that is not in Jerusalem, but he hears word from one of his brethren about the state of Jerusalem. And when he hears the words, obviously he breaks down and weeps. I want to preach along the lines this week on the special place of fellowship that you have. Because listen, in the Old Testament, God chose one special place where He put that Old Testament temple. Do you remember way back when Abraham offered up Isaac in Genesis 22? That area, Mount Moriah, was the place, that same area where years later David had made a mistake, made a sin, God had judged Israel, he had numbered the people, God plagued the people, and the sword and the angel of the Lord stood in a certain place of a threshing floor, and God says, that is going to be my place. And that's the temple mount today. And that is used all throughout the book of Nehemiah. We don't have time to look at them, but we have a chosen place, verse number 9. You see that. We have a working place in chapter 3. We'll get to that. There's a fighting place in chapter 4, verse number 20. There's also a learning place, chapter 8, verse 7. And there's a worshiping place. Now, this place, when you think all of that and try to transpose it into your Christian life, we don't have a temple where we worship God. Your church is not, quote unquote, the house of God. Your body is. If you're saved, Paul the Apostle said, what? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which you have of God. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. So there's a special place of fellowship 
God actually lives inside of you if you're saved. Now, by the way, if you're not saved, you need to get saved this week. If you die without knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're going to go to a bad place. An awful place. A place of burning and torment. You don't have to pay for your sins. Jesus already paid for your sins. So you can't even develop this special place of fellowship until you invite God into your heart and until He comes in. And so we have this special place, each and every one of us. Now when you think about Israel, they were in exile. They had rebelled against God, if you will. They had backslidden. I'm sure none of you have ever done that. <laughs> and they had gotten in exile. God judged them. And they were in exile. But there was a call from God. He gave prophecy through Jeremiah and said, Look, after 70 years, I want you to get back to your place. Some of you this week, you need to leave the Babylonian exile of your backslidden condition. And you need to get back to your place of fellowship. I'm not here preaching church attendance. I'm not here preaching how many times you need to read your Bible. I'm not here preaching a religion, but rather a relationship with Jesus. Hey, if you'll get your place right between you and Him, all that other stuff will fit, be fixed. So tonight, well, I want us to look at this. This is the condition of your place. Obviously, Nehemiah had heard some things. And here's the thing. How are you going to fix what's wrong if you don't know what's wrong? You say, preacher, you're, stand, you're telling me that I might not be right with God and maybe some things have happened in your life recently. Maybe you've gotten a little further. And by the way, God doesn't move, we move. Maybe you're not where you need to be. Can I just maybe get you to nudge forward a little bit and say, that might be me tonight. Maybe I could be a little closer to Jesus. Maybe I could... Develop that place of fellowship a little better? Yes, that's good. You know, it's a difference in building the relationship with the Lord from the inside than from the outside. You know, uh, people clean up pretty good when they go to prison. People in prison, they, do, they can do what they're told. We preach at a prison in our county, and it's one of four or five, I think it may be four, prisons in the entire state of Florida this is what they would call a good merit prison. In other words, you have to be on your best behavior to get here. Now, you could still be serving life and done despicable things, but you have to have a real good track record. If you mess up, if you get out of line, they ship you. So really, you have the best of the best, the cream of the crop. You know, that prison there has a good atmosphere. It's got a good spirit to it. The staff there, they're a little more easygoing. There's not as much conflict. And I preached there years ago with Dr. Ruckman, actually. He came and preached there, and it was a psycho prison. All of the prisoners were on medicine. And you talk about a messed up situation. A whole different atmosphere. And the idea is, you might can see people, because of incentive and because of what they can get physically, mold on the outside to clean up. Well, I might could twist your arm and strong arm you into maybe memorizing your verse if you'll eat or maybe get an extra dessert if you'll say how many commas are in the verse tonight. I might could do some things to make you conform from the outside. But is that how we're supposed to live our Christian life? Should you serve Jesus Christ because if you don't, you know He's going to knock the tar out of you? Should you serve Jesus Christ because you're just scared of Him all the time? Is God a big ogre hiding behind the tree waiting for you to mess up so He can beat you on the head with a stick? The Bible says, Perfect love casteth out fear because fear hath torment. Or do we serve Jesus Christ like Paul said, the love of Christ constraineth us. Paul said, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So here's the idea. The idea is to look at the condition of your place to try to get an evaluation of where you are so maybe through the help of the Holy Spirit you can make some changes and begin to build and make a place, a habitation of God where He will be happy there. You know everything you look at, He looks at? Yeah. 
Everything you eat, He eats. Everything you see, He sees. Everything you listen to, He listens to. Everything you say, He's right there. He's inside of you. Is it a good tabernacle? Is it a good place for Him to be? So we should be transformed by the renewing of our mind from the inside out. And if you can change from the inside out, then there's no need to have to be beat over the head all the time with some type of religion. There's great gladness in Nehemiah chapter 8. Lord willing, we'll get there in a few days. But there must be verse number 3, great affliction first. I'm going to give you these few things about the condition of your place tonight. Number one, number one, you have to believe what you hear. In verse number 2, one of his brothers comes and he says, Hey, let me tell you what's going on. And he begins to tell him, about the conditions. So number one, believe what you hear. Now all through the week, every message, my sub points are outlined. Each one of them is going to end in T-I-O-N. Don't ask me where that came from. I just got on the roll. And so you can put all these things together. There's really no huge significance except they do point to the uh, point. But notice in verse number two, there has to be interrogation. There has to be interrogation. Nehemiah asked him, how's it going? If you really want to get something out of camp this week and you really want to develop your place of fellowship, I'm talking about that place where it's just you and Jesus. Then you've got to ask the hard questions. You must ask the right questions. Interrogation, verse number two. Notice verse number three, information. They said unto me, the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down. The gates thereof are consumed with fire. You're going to have to ask the right questions this week. And as you examine your place, you're going to have to also be a good listener. You know what the Lord might do through the Scriptures? And the Lord might do through some of the songs? You know what the Lord might do through some of the testimonies? He might give you some of the answers. And He might reveal some things. You might think everything's great. You might think you pull your shirt back and it says SS, Super Saint. (laughs) As we get into this, you might realize you might not be as super a saint as you think you are. you got to ask the right questions, but you got to be a good listener. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. The summary in verse number 3, there's a remnant, obviously, but they're in ruin... And they're in reproach. Three negative things. They're a remnant. It's just a small group. That's tough when it's just a small group, but they're in ruin and they're in approach. Let me give you this acrostic. An acrostic is where you take each letter, and if you don't have time to jot it down, I can give it to you later, but I want to I give it to you kind of quick. But when you take each letter and you can get something from that letter, the word application. You ever hear preachers say, hey, we need to find application with this. In other words, you need to apply this to your life. So here's the application. Number one, is there an attitude to adjust? A. Is there an attitude to adjust? P. Is there a priority to change? Examine your priorities. Is there a priority to change? I. No, I'm sorry. I got another P. I wrote mine going across this way. P. Is there a promise to claim? Is there a promise to claim? L, is there a lesson to learn? L, is there a lesson to learn? I, is there an issue to resolve? Is there an issue to resolve? C, is there a command to obey? C, is there a command to obey? A, is there an activity? To avoid or stop? Is there an activity to stop? Or you could say, is there an activity to start? T, is there a truth to believe? T, is there a truth to believe? I, is there an idol to tear down? I, is there an idol to tear down? 
Oh, is there an offense to forgive? You want to, you want to apply Scripture? You want an application? Is there an offense to forgive? Oh. In. In. Is there a new direction to take? In. Is there a new direction to take? And then, of course, S, you can't live out, leave out, is there a sin to confess? S, is there a sin to confess? Do you read the Word of God just so you can say you read the Bible? I mean, I've fallen into that trap, and I've had my verses, I've got my chapters I've got to read for the day. Who does it? And you look at it and you go through there and your mind gets to wondering. You're thinking about all the things you got to do and you got to, wait, I got to back up. <laughs> I've gotten to now, when I read the Psalms, I have to read them out loud. They're so much and they're so deep. Proverbs, I have to take one proverb at a time. And the Psalms, I have to read it out loud. It's just too much to fly through there. But let me give you this. When you read God's Word, it begins to get in you. When you research God's Word, it gets you in the Word. When you remember God's Word, you're going to need it one day. When you reflect on God's Word, you live it. Everything begins to relate to the Scripture. When you receive God's Word, you accept it and you believe it. When you respond to God's Word, you agree with it. And when you react by God's Word, you begin to really live it out. Everything you do, you should react according to how God wants you to react. Why? Because He's living inside of you. But that's not going to happen if that place of fellowship is in disrepair. That is not going to happen if that place of fellowship has got holes and, and gates torn down and other stuff's all in and other people are in and infiltrated it and the Holy Spirit's not welcome. That's not going to happen if your place of fellowship is not in good condition. How's your condition tonight? What is the condition of your place? You say, I want to find out. Well, you got to believe what you hear. When the Holy Spirit of God says, that's it. You better listen. Number two, verse number four, you've got to be bothered by what you hear. You've got to be bothered by what you hear. Verse number four, when Nehemiah hears this, he doesn't go get a cup of coffee. When he hears this, verse number four, he sits down. You ever hear somebody say, hey, i got some news, but you need to sit down. I've seen people literally in my ministry I've had to deliver some bad news before. I have been the bearer of very bad tidings, death and different things like that. And I've seen, literally, I've seen people, you tell them the news and they fall. They literally can't hold themselves up. They crumble. That's why they say you better sit down. Nehemiah, literally, he hears this and his knees get weak. His physical constitution is affected. I like it when you jump high and run around. That's great. But if you can do that, but you can't be bothered by the sin in your life, and you can't be bothered by the condition of your place, something's out of place. It should bother you that things might not be right between you and the Lord. Notice in verse number 4, the lamentation. He meditates here. Meditation is in the Bible. That's not just some New Age thing. We got a lot of New Agers down there in uh, South Florida, so believe me, we got them down there just like y'all have them here. Uh, this whole world's headed to hell, man. Uh, you might have, we might have a little more uh, conservative government or, or whatever you say. You know, I live in the country of Florida, you know, thank God. Uh, but, you know, it's headed for hell just like people are just as wicked there as they are here. Some of the boundaries might not be down yet, but those boundaries are coming down. Our small county is the largest pot-producing agricultural place in the whole state of Florida. You can drive by and they have this huge place off of one of our highways in my little county where they have this huge pot-growing place. Oh, for medicinal purposes, of course. This whole place is shot. Meditation. Meditation is not just for the New Age weird people. You are to meditate on what God says. It sinks into Nehemiah and it bothers him. He laments. He meditates. He mourns. He fasts and he prays. 
I don't know that he's fasting so much just to try to get a hold of God is that maybe he simply lost his appetite. He's just so hungry for God and he's so upset at this point, he's not even worried about food. He's mourning. The Bible says, draw nigh to God and He'll draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, your joy to heaviness. You want the great gladness that we're going to get to in Nehemiah chapter 8 and 9? We need to have the great affliction. That's our, come on, preacher. We have to see the ruin if we're going to be able to build from that. Notice there's lamentation in verse number 4. Notice verses 5 and 6, there's supplication. We don't have time to look at all these verses, but I went through in Nehemiah, and there are scores of verses here where Nehemiah is praying. He was a praying man. In chapter 2, man, he takes his petition straight to God. He prays. And you'll notice supplication... Information leads to intercession. Notice verses 6 and 7, we have confession. He begins to pray. And he prays to God and he uses verse number 7, we, the pronoun including himself, in his confession. We have dealt corruptly against thee, have not kept thy commandments, nor thy statutes, nor thy judgment. It's not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, O Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Maybe you're one of those Christians, you sit there and the preacher gets to preach and you're thinking, get him, man, get him. That, that one right there, he, well, he, he really needs that. Oh, she really needs that. <laughs> no, maybe you really need that. Yes. Yes. Nehemiah's taking this thing personally. Amen. And he says, Lord, we've dropped the ball. Supplication, confession, application, verses 8 through 11. He takes the Mosaic law and he remembers there's a little ray of hope here and he remembers that God has given some promises there. And you know what? Information leads to intercession, intercession which leads to involvement. Nehemiah here, in verse number 11, begins to feel obligation. There's that other I-O-N word. Verse number 11, Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant, to the prayer of thy servants, who desire to fear thy name and to prosper. I pray thee, thy servant, this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. There's obligation. You say, why? Because of the whole scheme of things. Here's Nehemiah, and he is a cupbearer in the palace of the Persians. He's not in... Um, Jerusalem with the rest of the remnant, but he is in a place, God has put him there through his past where in his present he can glorify God. And now he feels a sense of obligation. You know, if you start praying about a situation long enough, the reason a lot of people don't pray for missions is because they don't want to be a missionary. And you know, if you have somebody that's hurt you and done you wrong, if you'll pray for them long enough, you'll, you'll be able to forgive them. And his prayers to God, that information leads to intercession, which leads to obligation and involvement. And here, the thing begins to take off. You know, some people, they just simply don't know the condition of their place. And you've got to show them. I think it was uh, Sam Jones, he mentioned preaching to people and he had a church that was not responding well and he says, I photograph your ugliness and show it to you and you laugh at it. And sometimes the preacher preaches and bears his heart and gives you the word and maybe the messenger comes back, verse number 2, and says, hey, there's a bad thing going on. This whole wall's torn down. Everything's on fire. The remnant's just in reproach. And you're like, well, what's that to me? I have it pretty good. You know, I'm the king's cupbearer and I've got it made and I've got a retirement, you know, and I'm not going to leave here. In October the 2nd, 1996, Aero Peru 757 went down in the Pacific Ocean, 50 miles northwest of Lima. Everyone on board was killed. And of course, um, they went back and began to try to find out what happened. And the pilot... He is flying and his sensors are not picking up right. And so he thinks that maybe the plane has got some ice on the, uh, the sensors and everything. So he's lowering his altitude and he's coming down further and further and things just aren't working right. 
and he's calling out to the uh, uh, air traffic control, so on and so forth. Well, he gets lower and lower and lower, and eventually he goes right into the, the water. Well, come to find out when they went and did all their research, you know how they investigate to find out what happened. Prior to the plane taking off, you know how they'll do all their inspections and they'll take the washers and they'll actually wash the planes and things. Well, they had taken tape and they had put them over sensitive areas where they don't need to high pressure water wash those areas and they'd put those tape over those areas. But someone had forgotten to remove the tape. So therefore, the thing that should have been able to pick up on all the trouble that was going on, didn't have a clue. The censors couldn't take in the information. And sometimes I think Christians, you just go through your life and you're not sensitive. you got duct tape over your senses. Maybe you've grieved the Holy Spirit of God. Maybe you've quenched the Holy Spirit of God. And you think everything's good. But the condition of your place, if we could see it, the gates are all torn down. It's in reproach. The the walls are all crumbling. There's rubbish everywhere. The Ammonites are in. All these people have infiltrated. Tobiah's in there. God's not being honored. But you don't see it. So how do I see it? Well, you've got to believe what you hear. And I'm telling you, some of you tonight and this week, you need to look at your place because your place is not good. You're in a bad place. Come on, preacher. You need to see that. Yes. Believe what you hear. Be bothered by what you hear. It ought to bother you. Amen. Yes. Because you are here to glorify Jesus with your life. Yeah. And then number three, this will be it. For tonight, chapter number two. The positive side of the message You need to believe God can do something about the condition of your place. I don't believe it would be in the heart of Pastor Kim and the other pastors that are here and everyone that's set aside this whole week and the time and taking the time off from work and all the things that have to work for this camp to take place if we didn't have a ray of hope that something good could come out of it. If you're here and you're not saved, one of the best things could be for you to get saved here this week. Get saved. But for our own spiritual growth, the Lord's not done with you or He would not have you here tonight. There's there's a ray of hope here. Nehemiah has an obligation because the wheels get to turn and he thinks, you know what? I'm in pretty good with the king. The cupbearer was a big deal back in those days. The cupbearer, he would take, like we see Jesus around the table with the disciples and squeeze out the cup and they would take and they would make that juice for the king oftentimes. And oftentimes when they would get special wine and things that was given as gifts for the monarchy, for the king and queen, the cupbearer would obviously pour a little in a cup, and he would taste that first. If he dropped over dead, the king knew not to drink it. (laughs) So a pretty important job. Uh, I don't know that I'd want to be the cupbearer. But he was in really close with the king. In chapter number 2, it says, it's in the month of Nisan, four months have passed since Nehemiah heard about this problem. Nehemiah has already wept and prayed And he's already been waiting and praying. There's some time going on. He's evaluating. The things are turning in his mind and he's thinking about the condition. He's far removed from where he needs to be and he realizes this place is in disarray and and it's it's destroyed. So in chapter 2, verses 1 through 8, we have confirmation. Confirmation that God can do something about it. Nehemiah sends up that classic Nehemiah prayer. He's talking to the king there. Nehemiah is a man of prayer. And one thing about your place of fellowship, that's just you and him. And you pray to him. That's your place. Nehemiah had that place of fellowship and he prayed so much he was so in tune with God. And as he's talking to the king and he's telling the king, he's sitting there, standing there, and he can't hide his countenance. You know, when something's really bothering you, those who know you best... They can say, what's wrong? You're like, oh, everything's fine. And put on your plastic smile. And they're like, no, everybody else thinks everything's good, but they know you're really good. No, tell me what's going on. Nehemiah 
was upset. And it showed. It showed on his face. The king says, what's going on? Well, the king sent up a Nehemiah prayer. He said he prayed to the God of heaven and said. So he's praying as he's talking. And he tells the king what happened about the sepulchers lying in waste and the gates consumed with fire, verse number 3. And the king says, what do you need? Nehemiah knew the wheels were turning. Nehemiah knew that he needed the king's provision and the king's protection. And so we have prayer. We have Nehemiah overcoming fear. We have Nehemiah grasping for opportunities. We have Nehemiah asking in faith. And he gives Nehemiah confirmation. The king says, what do you need? What you need? How long do you want to go? What do you need? I'll take care of it. My mind goes back in my eye to when I was uh, 18 years old and graduated high school. I felt a call to preach. I'd gotten involved in a little Bible-believing church that had just started up from a former missionary. And I kind of thought that, man, I just need to stay here and help him and maybe we could build this ministry. Previously, I had it in my mind I was going to head off down to Pensacola. But because we had this new little church started, I thought I would just get in there and help him. You know, I didn't really know what to do. By the way, when you're young, you know, like 25 and younger, I want to say, sometimes, you know, you kind of jump before you think. Sometimes you need someone that's just got a little little age on them. It's not that they're better than you. They just got a little more experience. Well, I had a guy come and he visited and he was planning on going to PBI and he's one of my close friends. Closest friends now. He's a PhD too. I had to introduce you to him one day. And he graduated after me, but he said, Brother, he goes, I would, I would uh, go on to PBI if I were you. I'm thinking, Well, you know, I, I thought I was going to get in and help with this ministry. And he's like, You know, he's older than me and, and he had a little wisdom. He goes, Look, I ain't trying to overstep. He goes, But you got an opportunity now, you know. I was praying about that thing and the time was running out. You know, it was getting close to September and time was ticking. And so I went to my dad. And my dad uh, led me to the Lord. My dad was one of the most spiritual men I ever knew. And I went to my dad and I said, I'm thinking about, you know, doing this, you know. And he said, uh, Well, you can have the truck and here's a credit card. Whatever you need. Yeah. So I showed up on orientation night. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. A little, little leeway in there, man. I could have made the wrong decision, I think. That was one of the best decisions. Amen. Outside of getting saved, that led up to me making one of the most other important decisions. That's where I met my wife and got married. Amen. That's where I learned the Bible and was sent into the ministry. So you begin to look at these things. Nehemiah needs some confirmation. And he got confirmation as soon as the king says... Hey, what do you need? And Nehemiah's like, okay, you know what? There is hope that I can do something about the condition of that place. Verse number 10, I'm telling you, as soon as you realize God is not through with you, as soon as you realize there's hope, there's going to be some opposition. Now we're introduced here in verse number 10 to Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant the Ammonite. We're introduced to these guys. We're going to see them later on in the book of Nehemiah. As a matter of fact, we're going to see Tobiah all the way at the end of Nehemiah as well, believe it or not. When they hear about this, the Bible says it grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. You know, uh, the devil doesn't appreciate what we're doing here this week. We're driving down the road coming here and all of a sudden, thump. I'm thinking, ah, it's just California roads, you know. (laughs) Interstate 10. Thump. Then we keep going along, you know, and we're talking about some great deep theological issue, I think. <laughs> Driving down the road, and then some guy in the truck pulls over. You know, he had a big old 4 before truck. He's probably from the south. That's what I was thinking. He's a good old boy. He's a good old boy from the south, no doubt. Probably from the state of Georgia. That's where I'm from. But he looked over at Pastor Kim, and he's like, you know, he wasn't giving him the Hawaiian good luck sign. You know, the middle finger. He's staying like this, you know. And so he's like, something's going on. So, hey, we got to pull over. And lo and behold, we didn't have a flat tire. And yet he began to think about that one little thing and thank the Lord we were not injured, nothing happened. Praise the Lord. I can tell you this. 
Some of you had some opposition even getting here. Come on, preacher. Some of you last week, you had opposition. Yes. And there's going to be opposition as you examine the place of fellowship in your life. There's somebody that's grieved that you think that God can change some things in your life. And that's the devil himself. And that's these evil spirits that want to hinder what God wants to do in your life. You don't need to listen to that. Amen. Eve got into trouble when she started listening to other voices. Yes. You need to listen to this book right here. Amen. And I'm telling you, Nehemiah had confirmation that God could do something about this. I'm telling you here, God can do something. Amen. There's opposition. Notice in verses 11 to 15, there's evaluation. Nehemiah has got to go there. There's a waiting period involved in verse number 11 in this evaluation. He's got to see for himself. And other people can give testimony. Folks can talk about their place of fellowship. I'm sure we'll have some testimony sometime this week. and We can get up and give illustrations. We can talk about it. But you have got to see for yourself. Yes. When you got saved, that was between you and the Lord. God doesn't have grandchildren. He only has children. Amen. And the things that are out of balance in your place, the things that are broken down in your place, the rubbish that's in your place, you're the only one that knows about that. And you're the only one that can really evaluate it. And if you'll let the Holy Spirit through the Word of God shine the light of the Word of God on that to see it for what it really is. So what you've already done is made excuses for all that stuff. Like, well, you know, I've got a few gates still intact. And part of that wall standing over there. And, you know, there's, it stinks real bad. But, you know, it doesn't stink too bad over there. I've got rubbish over here. But, you know, it's like, like so-and-so's backyard, man. They've got trash all over the place. I'm not as bad as them. You know, you're already making excuses. You've got to have that evaluation process. And you've got to see it like the Lord sees it. It's unclean. And you say, well, if you measure yourself among yourselves, you're not wise. You've got to hold it up to Him yeah. and to His holiness. Yes. Notice the waiting involved, verse number 11. Notice the work involved, verses 12 to 15. Nehemiah here gets up and he has to go by night. Notice he's awake when others are asleep. Church age right now is typified as nighttime. Jesus comes in the morning. You think about all those things. A lot of Christians are just asleep. They're not going to take the time to invest in their spiritual life. They're not going to take the time to remove the rubbish. They're not going to take the time to even admit that there's rubbish in their life. They wouldn't dare delete a social media account even if the Holy Spirit said so. They wouldn't dare change their preference of music. They wouldn't dare change some of them their Bible version that they use. They wouldn't dare quit some of their foolishness. You know what I see among Bible believers as far as sin and immorality goes when you compare it to the Laodicean Christians? I see hardly any difference. Really, the only difference I see is doctrinal convictions. It's people committing fornication that use new Bibles. People committing fornication that have a King James Bible. People get people have problem gossiping and talking about people that use new Bibles. People gossip and talk about people that use the King James only. There are people that are lazy and don't study the Word of God and don't witness that use the new Bibles. There are Christians that don't study their Bibles that have a King James Bible that don't witness even though they know the King James Bible. The divorce rate among King James Bible believers is just about as high as among those that use the other Bibles. So, if your, your claim to spirituality is that you have a King James Bible, that's not going to go very far at this camp. You can have a King James Bible and still have a lot of rubbish inside. But Nehemiah is going to be awake when the others are asleep. There's plenty of King James Bible believers that are asleep on the job. Paul says it's high time to wake out of sleep. Now is our salvation nearer than, the, than when we believe. They need to put off these sins he talks about. It's time to wake up. Yes. Nehemiah is awake when others are sleeping. Notice he's working when others are resting. He has to leave his, his, his mule behind and, and go through there on his own. 
You know, self-examination is not easy work. It's called discipline. It's discipleship. These messages aren't tickle-your-ear messages. Evaluating the sin in your life and being honest with yourself where you can be honest with God is sometimes the hardest part about our Christian life. Opposition, evaluation, consideration. Verse number 16. He's got to think this thing through. How do I go about this? You ever look in a room, you, maybe you have a project, maybe you got a shed outside or you got a project room and you just get to where you throw all this stuff in, you got all this stuff there and it's time to clean it out and you, you got to kind of attack it. And you got to think, uh, okay, how am I going to do this? You think you're just going to run in there and start putting this there, that there, what's going to happen is you're going to get there and move this. Then you're going to realize there's another problem. I don't have a place to put this thing. So now I've got to go find another place to put this thing. And then this road leads to that road. And you have all these things going on. And then you have a bigger mess than when you started. Because now you done pulled everything out of the boxes. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Am I the only crazy guy? Yes. There's a consideration here. Okay? There's some priorities. You've got to deal with some big stuff. Some of you might have some big rubbish, some big issues in your life you need to deal with. Emotional and spiritual things, you need to deal with those things first. Nehemiah logistically is looking at this thing. It's work. There's a consideration process here. He didn't just go there so he could wallow in the ruins. I'm not going to get up here and just preach on sin so you can wallow in sin. You know what sin is. You know how wicked you are. Yes. I'm not here and we're not here just to wallow in the ruins. Nehemiah went there so he could do something about it. There's consideration in verse 17. There's determination. He says to the brethren, he says, You see the distress that we are in? How Jerusalem lieth waste, the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem that we be no more a reproach. Many had been living with those conditions the whole time. They were used to it. But Nehemiah comes and he is determined not to put up with that anymore. So a preacher, I'm not going to count my chickens before I hatch. I know how it is. You go and you confess and you get all these things right at camp and you go back and you, and you just fall right back in the trap. Don't listen to the devil. You can come down here tonight. You can get things right tonight and you don't have to give it up when you get back out there. You can stand up for Jesus tonight and you can stand up for Jesus when you get back out there. Yes. Amen. Don't listen to those lies. A lot of people see the problems, but Nehemiah saw the problems and the potential. And I'll close with this illustration here. At the end of World War II, an American sub came back and they went to Newport News, Virginia, right outside there to dock. And they had a problem right before they came into the port with their mechanisms and they began to sink. And they went down. Just, they just began to sink. You know how they have all those calibrations with the air pressure and all that? Well, they immediately, the people on the port, they began to send rescue teams out and they began to send divers out. And the divers, when they went down, there was a... One of the seamen, he had an ingenious idea. He had taken a hammer of some type of tool and he began to do Morse code on that submarine so maybe if a diver's there, they could hear. The first words that they heard in Morse code, it was a question. And this is what they wanted to know. Is there hope? Is there hope? I'm telling you tonight, as you look at the condition of your place, You might be in a mess tonight. But there's power in the blood of Jesus Christ. And there is hope. And you can rebuild. You can get some things right this week. Amen. Preacher, come ahead.